lot of us have ditched our old web browsers and started using Firefox. There, there's a lot of good reasons to use Firefox. For one thing, it's, it's a hell of a lot more secure than Internet Explorer. Um, you have the tabbed web browsing, which is a great feature. I use that a lot. And the extensions are great. There's, there's a shitload of extensions out there for Firefox, but if you load too many, then um, it's going to take forever for, for your web browser to load up. So today we're going to show you our favorites, show you basically Firefox extensions that don't suck. Okay, the first extension that, that I'm going to show you today is called Adblock Plus. Um, basically, as it says, it basically blocks all the, the ads. Um, I haven't used this before. It was recommended, me, recommended to me by JD. I don't have much problems with ads or pop-ups or anything like that. I don't surf the transactional porn sites, but hey, if you do, I'm told this program works great. Um, you can add, you can filter out sites that you don't want to go on or add in an exception. For example, uh, we can add in the, the BSOD site. And then just click OK and see how it works. Um, like I said, I haven't really used it much, but I'm told it's great. Give it a try. Now on to the next one. People are using Gmail as their, as their, for their email, uh, which is a good thing for some people. It has lots of space, and hey, it's free. And you, you can't beat that. The problem with any web-based email is you don't know when you're getting a new message. So if somebody sends you an email, it could sit in your email box for days and you'll never know about it unless you log on and check. Well, that's changed with, with this extension. Um, with Gmail Manager, it adds this little icon down in the bottom of Firefox. So whenever you're... Oh, it's over here, sorry. But whenever you're have Firefox open, you'll see if you have email or not, it'll automatically alert you. It's very simple to set up. Just double click on this icon down here and then uh, up here just click add, enter in your email and your password, which I'm not going to add in because I don't use Odyssey. And there's a couple other different settings in here. I'm not going to go through them all. But click apply and then OK and whenever you get an email message, it'll show you right down here that you have email. This by far is one of my favorite um, Firefox extensions. It's called Video Downloader. Um, basically, go to a site like YouTube. There's many other, Google Video, whatever. Uh, say you find a video that you really like, uh, you want to send to a friend, or you just want to back up to DVD, whatever. For example, we found BSOD Episode 1 on YouTube. So you go to that site, and then just go down here. Click this little um, icon on Firefox. And as soon as my computer stops being slow, it opens up this window and you just click the download link. And it'll actually download the video for you. Now, I think it's useful. Forecast Fox is another nice extension for basically telling you your weather forecast in the area you're at. To set that up, go to Tools and then Extensions. Find, find the Forecast Fox and just double click it. It'll open the window. You can create a new profile. Then in here, you just type in your zip code. Um, unit of measurement. I'm in America, so I use that. You got different settings over here to enable, like if you want the today's forecast or extended forecast, all that information. You can play with it and figure it out. Click apply, and then OK. And then down here, you got your weather forecast at the bottom of Firefox. Do you download a lot of files from an FTP website or HFS and you're tired of clicking on each and every individual file? You have to wait for one to finish downloading and then click the next. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, I don't like doing it myself. So I use Down Them All. It's a great extension. Uh, basically, go to a website, FTP or HFS. It's got a lot of files on it that you want, like if you want everything on the page. Just go to Tools, uh, Down Them All just like that now we got all the files you can you can queue them up and start downloading them and it'll download them each each and every one on the site individually I think it's a great little extension saves a lot of time that way you can download a lot of shit walk away from your computer come back in half an hour an hour later whatever and it's done
Do you get tired of going to your cell phone provider's website just to send an SMS message or trying to pound it out on your cell phone? It can be a real pain in the ass. It'd be much easier if it was just built into Firefox, right? Well, this extension is exactly that. Um, Auto SMS. Uh, basically, you can send SMS messages right from Firefox. Uh, once you add the extension on, just uh, click the provider. I'm in the United States. I use T-Mobile. They're great. Type in somebody's phone number, then the message, and then just copy the code in here and click send. And it sends the message to them. Can't be simpler, can it? Sometimes when you're reading websites or chatting on IRC or instant messaging, uh, somebody will type something out and you really don't know how to pronounce the word and you want to talk about it later in person, but you don't want to sound like an idiot mispronouncing the word. Well, this program is great. It's called Pronounce and basically it adds this little box up here and you just type in a word and it will actually read it out to you. Incontinent. Google Maps are nice, but sometimes you want a better image than just a satellite image if you want to check out an area. So wouldn't it be nice to put the power of Google Maps and Flickr together to make a more powerful tool? Well, now you can with this extension, Photo Map. Um, basically, once you install it, go to Tools, down to Photo Map, select whatever area you, you want to put a picture of, click Edit. You can create an account and then just upload the picture of your file. Uh, upload the file, the picture of whatever area that you're at. And now you can see an actual image instead of just a satellite image of the area. We've all been to poorly designed websites that are just plain painful on the eyes to look at. Um, if you go to a site like that, there's a great extension to take care of that also. It's, it's called No Squint. Um, basically, go to Tools, then down to No Squint Settings, and you can zoom in if the text is too small. Sometimes, even if they use lousy colors, just blowing up the text makes it a little bit easier to see. Ever been cruising the web and you've seen a picture that you would really like on your cell phone? Well, here's a cool extension. It's called Pics to Phone. And basically, you just find a picture that you like and you want on your phone or possibly a really nasty picture that no one would like and you'd like to send to one of your friend's phones, but we won't get into that. And just right-click on the picture and go Save Picture to My Mobile Phone. As you see, the picture comes up. And now you got some different options, like you can fit it to the screen, resize it, whatever. Uh, just click OK. Type in the cell phone number. I don't know, I'll just make up a number here. And select the carrier. Click Send to SMS. And of course, you got to enter a verification code, but that's just to stop people from spamming. There's many search add-ons out there, so I figured I'd have to mention one on this show at least. So I found the one that I thought was best, and I'm going to show you how it works. This is called Slim Search. Basically, just highlight a word on any website. Then you can right-click and go to Slim Search. Now you can look it up in Google, uh, Frugal, eBay, YouTube, pretty much anywhere. When I'm downloading large files, I don't like to sit there and have the Firefox Download Manager open, but I do like to keep track of how far the download's done. So when I'm reading other sites wasting time, I don't kill half the day because I forget my download's done. So I got this nice little add-on. Um, it's called Download Status Bar. Uh, basically what it does is when you download a file, it puts it down here. Uh, just go to a... Re to the site to download the file, download it in the normal way, save the disk or wherever you download it, and now it puts it down here and it'll show the status of it downloading. This is a small file so you didn't see it downloading but whatever. 
I sign up for a lot of free shit online, samples, whatever, free t-shirts, stuff like that. And I don't want to get a hell of a lot of spam in my email box, but a lot of them require you to use a valid email. So I found this, this add-on for trash mail. Uh, basically what it does is it creates disposable email addresses that actually work. They forward to your real email, but only for a limited time. So basically what you do is just right click wherever you got to fill in the email address and um, go uh, go to paste disposable email address now up here you just uh, new forward email address basically whatever email address you want at trash mail then in here type in your real email address so it will forward so you actually get the email and now you can just tell it, you know how many times you want it to forward or how long you want that email address active and for that amount of time it will forward the email to your email address but after that you won't get any more spam Leet Key is a nice little add-on. It can transform regular text to Leet Speak, Rot 13, Base 64, Hex, and different shit like that. Um, basically, you can just type in regular text, like this is an example, like I typed there. Just right-click on it, go to Leet Key, Text Transform, and we can transform it to, let's transform it to Hex, and it transforms it to Hex, or we can transform it to rot 13 well I don't think that worked right but you, you get the point and here you have chatzilla which is your basic um, web-based IRC client it it's simple basic and it does the job no big thrills I personally prefer MIRC but for those that don't it does a job and there you have it. That's our list of Firefox extensions that don't suck. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty more out there, and, and we'd love to hear about it. So if you can think of any more extensions that you think are good, uh, check out our forums or join our IRC channel on our IRC network, um, irc.bsodirc.org. Hello, I'm Dortz, and this is my customized, optimized XP environment. In this segment, I'm first going to cover setting a couple of useful tweaks for your XP environment to optimize it for gaming. Then I'm going to show you some great customizations you can make to XP that would really personalize it to your tastes, such as you know, hacking your start button. So I'm going to start with how to set a static page file. So the first thing you're going to do is open up the System Properties menu. To do that, just hit Windows key pause, and you're going to come up with this, and go to the Advanced tab, Performance, Settings, Advanced tab again, Virtual Memory, Change. Now, the default value for this is System Managed Size. You want to click on Custom Size, and change the value to typically twice the amount of RAM that you have. Now in the NTFS file system, 1 gig is 1024 megabytes. So I have 1 gig of RAM in this machine, so I set my initial size to 2 gigabytes or 2048. Since it's a static page file, we want to have the initial size equal the maximum size. So you set it to typically twice the amount of your RAM. This is a good idea because you have too high of a page file size, then you're going to have memory issues, too low, and it doesn't really do anything. So we're going to set that, OK, you'll apply it, you'll click OK, you'll apply it, you'll click OK, and it's going to come up with, you know, asking you to restart, go ahead and do the that. next thing I'm going to cover is services.msc. To get to that, just do start, run, services.msc. That's going to bring up services. So this will show you a list of all the services that are currently installed in your computer. Now you'll see if they're started, what kind, what way they're going to start up, if they do it automatically, if you have to do it manually, or if it's supposed to be disabled. Now there's a couple of uh, services that I, one that I just disabled, so it still has started just the next time I start Windows it won't or I could 
stop it right now. Bam. And I have the fast user switching that I only have one user account, so I don't need to use. Help and support, which I have never used. And of course, I just stopped error reporting service. So, those three, you don't really use them very often, I don't think. But if you're new to computers, I would suggest leaving help and support, error reporting, and fast user switching. Just leave it alone. Because if you don't know what a service does and you set it default disabled and it was actually a system critical file, your system will die. And that's bad. So you know, if you're not sure, set it to manual. See if it starts up and yells at you and tells you to start the service. So that would be that on services. Just be careful. Try not to break your computer at all. So now I'm going to switch gears and cover how to customize your machine for looks, not just performance. So first and most blazingly obvious, I'm going to hack the Windows Start menu, which I have already done. Uh, the tools I used here were Resource Hacker and Registry Editor. So I start with Resource Hacker, which is freeware. You can just Google it and find it real quick. And you just file, open, and navigate to your Windows folder. That's C Windows. You can scroll over and you'll find explorer.exe. There's several others here that I have run over this a couple of times. So open explorer.exe. Before you do anything, save as another file name, which is very important to have. Yes, I would like to replace that, but you know you wouldn't have to deal with that normally. I already did that. So what is explorer.exe? Well, basically, it is the front end of your computer. All the dialog boxes, everything is in explorer.exe, including a few really fun entertaining values in the string table here. You'll notice in here, there's a lot of them that look really familiar from the start menu. Especially value 37 here, which has start on it. And if you change this to whatever you want, and it, every time you uh, change a value in one of these tables, you will have to recompile it, which is why you need to work in a different name. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to recompile it, because it's running funny how that works so and change help and support Windows security or run tab whatever you want to do and when you're done file save you can close that now open up your registry editor and double check in here that there's my cracked version of Explorer it stays in the Windows folder where the regular Explorer is so now to registry editor which you don't know how to get to that it's just start button run regedit now I'll open up the registry editor and you need to navigate to my computer H key local machine software Microsoft Windows NT current version win logon and in there you're gonna find the value shell right click modify the original value here is explorer.exe. I changed it to my file name. Went OK. And that's about it for hacking your start bar. You can you can shut down and restart now and it will be updated hopefully if you have done this correctly. Now I'm going to go through changing that ugly ass XP logon screen. There's several places online you can go. Uh, first I would choose would be DeviantArt, although sometimes you have to compile those on your own and that can be tricky. Or you can go to wincustomize.com where they have loads and loads of boot skins and loads and loads of logon screens that are just really useful. So 
you can download one from here you can make one on your own I'm not going to show you how to because I am crap at it and I'm horrible with graphics so I'm just going to assume that you know how to download stuff and you can download this one thing you do have to check for is make sure that when you do it is updated you know and compiled properly if it comes in a dot exe in other words that's what you want so once you have that you want to take it in your windows folder and you want to put it in system 32 we there we go uh, let's search around here and find there it is I've already downloaded and put this one in there this is log on you UI FBI dot exe. Note the original one is log on UI dot exe. So we go back to our friend registry editor. We go back to the original key we had before my computer, HK local machine, software, Microsoft, Windows NT, current version, win logon. Just below the shell, UI host, you'll see it's very similar to the file path of logonui.exe. I've already changed it to my file name, logonuifbi.exe. You just click OK. You can log off and you'll see your logon screen. So, again, very simple. Now, the next thing I'm going to go over is a program from Stardock. Now, this program is called Bootskin. Now, uh, Bootskin is a rather easy to use program that will, in effect, hack your boot screen for you. Now, there's a couple options here. Like, they have some pre installed ones, but they aren't all that good. But lucky enough, at wincustomize.com, they have boot skins that are all pre created and pre customized for boot skin. Like when you look for a file and import a file, it looks for a boot skin file. All these are in boot skin format already for you. It's really convenient. So you just download it, open it from here to import it. And you can choose anyone here, click apply. Boot screen applied successfully. You can preview it. I'm a, I like my own, so I'm going to keep my own right there. See, looks real nice. So that really is it's that easy for Bootskin. And the thing with Bootskin is it is a leaps and bounds better than anything I could do just hacking the boot screen because this uses a boot time frame buffer that works off of VESA boot time extensions, or VBE, that just about all graphics cards and chipsets can support VBE but double check with you know your manufacturer manual and all that just to be sure but um, basically what that does is instead of going in and changing the kernel the kernel remains untouched and so does it it just overrides the default boot screen so you can have a higher quality boot screen and it doesn't risk corrupting your computer at all so just keep that in mind if you want to put yourself through the pain and suffering of trying to edit your boot screen on your own or get boot skin and make your life a lot easier. Now the last thing I'm going to show you today is Hotkey Helper. Now this is a relatively small app, uh, easy to install, easy to run, and with it you can make almost any key combination into a hotkey. You can run stuff, you can start you know URLs you can change whatever you're listening to edit the volume settings you can change and set different shutdown commands if you want to you can set you know window settings if you really want to but mostly I just use it for run commands I use the upper level F keys so you can see I have my Winamp is set to it Mozilla is set to it my storage drive, my movies partition for Vista, just a lot of stuff in there that's, you know, just, I use those 
folders so often that it's just so convenient to have it. And it also looks kind of cool to go whoosh and have eight different windows open up. But, you know, it's easy to add, even easier to remove, and easy to edit whatever, all of them, including medias and all that. And then the options so you can enable the screen tip where if you strike one of the keys it's going to pop up on top with a little message saying hey you just hit this one I'm gonna put this up for three seconds to say you know this is the title of what you just did like say next you know this and that and the other thing and it will come through with uh, video games so you can see if it's working you know unless you know maybe your Winamp crashed so and have it start with Windows or not I like to but that's just me so apply okay and it will hide in your system tray for future use so that's that and uh... hope you enjoyed my little segment if you have any questions just ask on the BSOD forums which is forums.bsodtv.org or you can also hit me up on IRC my nick is Dortz happy Dortz If you've ever been lost, you understand how important it can be to have a compass on you to find out which way to go, to find civilization again. I don't carry a compass around, compass around on me. I'm guessing most people probably don't. I don't even know if I own one right now. But I do have a cell phone, and just about everybody nowadays has at least one cell phone. Some of us are whores like JD and own 50. But anyway, I found this program on the internet and it's it's great it's a compass for your cell phone so you always have a compass on you uh, I don't have GPS in my phone and I figured eh, it's not gonna work it's gonna require a GPS it doesn't it's basically a reverse sundial so you're not screwed if you don't have GPS it doesn't triangulate so you don't need a cell phone signal because out here you're not gonna get a signal but anyway let me try and show you how this works if my camera can actually pick up video off my cell phone okay sorry if you can't see this most of the people on YouTube probably can't but uh, it's asking are you in the north or south hemisphere I'm in the north hemisphere so I choose that are you in daylight savings time yes now it says lay the phone flat and point it towards the Sun the Sun ain't out so we're gonna just pretend that the Sun's in this direction and press OK now if you can see that it's got a compass on the screen that shows you which way north is. It's, it's stupidly simple. I mean, sundials have been out for centuries and centuries. People, the ancient people used them. But I've never heard of anybody before actually reversing it and actually knowing what time it is and using that to tell the direction of which way north is. I think it's a great little, great little program. That it's so stupidly simple, most people wouldn't think of it. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll try and put a link to the program in the show notes if I can find one, if I can't, and one if I can't. If it's open source, I'll put a copy up. We're here in my hellhole of a lab, so I can show you uh, how to make custom connectors and, and printed circuit boards, or PCBs. Making PCBs is fairly simple. If you can use a pen and a piece of paper, you can create a PCB, but there are some tricks and techniques to it. As for the custom connectors, you know, sometimes you need a connector and you don't have it or it's a custom connector I was actually asked by a couple of people through, uh, through email and instant message and all that crap to show my, uh, my Xbox to PC interfaces so people were asking me how did you get your, your keyboard hooked up to your, to your Xbox now the most convenient way is you go ahead and you buy the Xbox ad adapter yeah. this plugs into the Xbox you know female USB that's, that's pretty pretty easily said and done but uh, sometimes you really don't feel like spending like the eight dollars for the cable and ten dollars for shipping so if you notice that um, you know Xbox has the breakaway cable I'm gonna show you how to make a printed circuit board that'll fit in here and then it gives you a uh, a piece of uh, a female USB so today I'm gonna show you how to make that among some other things shit hole layout there I'm gonna turn pretty much make one of these. Um, I'm also going to show you how to make a uh, 
Xbox controller connector that's actually on the Xbox so you don't have to cut the cable to your Xbox controller. Like, you know, a lot of people will go and get a breakaway extension cable like so, and they'll just cut it, and they'll splice in a, a USB cable. So now you can use your, your Xbox controller on your computer, but you know, I'm not going to go and spend like 20 bucks on an Xbox controller just to cut the cable and splice in a USB cable. I think that's kind of craptastic. I kind of liked having all of my stuff intact. So I'm going to show you how to make the female end of a USB connector. I'm also going to show you how to make an SD card connector. So hopefully, uh, you know, you can be able, if you have like, you know, SD card connectors, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can add an SD card to, like the Linksys WRT. Hopefully Big Bro will show you that in a little bit. But you don't want to spend $8 for the connector and $4 for shipping. Not everyone's got a broken, uh, you know, SD card reader laying around. So, you know, maybe you got some, you have a better access to uh, making printed circuit boards. And, you know, you can just put one together pretty cheaply. So we're going to go to the desk side, and I'll show you some uh, techniques on making printed circuit boards. All right. The first thing you need to know is this is a copper, what's called a copper-clad PCB, or printed circuit board. It is two pieces of copper metal that uh, has a sandwich meat innard of fiberglass. To make a PCB, you take a marker, and you mark wherever you want actual circuit tracks, and then you're going to dump that later on, which I'll do the do's and don'ts, into PCB etchet solution. This is uh, ferric chloride. I'll get into the dangers of this stuff later, but it's relatively harmless if you're not an idiot. Okay? Now, when you're designing a PCB, um, don't, don't test your designs on your board. Um, test your designs on pen and paper. You know, compensate a little bit on the, on the actual board for, um, you know, uh, <laughs> connectors and soldering and all that stuff because a lot of times I see people who, who do they just draw straight onto the board first shot and then don't realize that oh wait I was supposed to be able to solder onto this like it has solder wires coming off of it and now I have no solder points okay now one of the first things I want to show you guys how to make is an SD card connector okay what I did with this board right here is I took my SD card and I lined it up Okay, knowing that, you know, where the pins exactly go. And just using the fat tip of the marker, I mean, it doesn't have to be too precise. If, using a straight edge helps, but I really don't care, as long as it works. This is most likely going to go on the inside of a project, so, you know, hide your sin. So what this does is, it, this is going to match up to here, okay? And then I took a piece of copper pipe, you know, this is used to keep your copper pipes, like, you know, pinned on, onto your ceiling or onto your floor, onto the walls, whatever. I flattened it in the desk vise, and using some needle nose pliers, I made this overhead bracket. So basically what happens now is I'm going to solder this like so, and then this is going to go in here. Now, as for the connectors, the actual physical slide-on connections, what you're going to do is you're going to go and get yourself an old floppy drive cable that has the card edge connectors. The card edge connector actually has, let me see if I can get this on, where am I? Right here, has like these little tabs, okay? There's one, here's the other. It really doesn't matter if you get this thing, you know, off in one piece, it doesn't matter. And inside are going to be all of these little pins. These are like pressure sensitive little pins. You see that? I hope so, okay? And I'm going to take these, once this is etched, and I'm going to solder them onto here. So when you slide your card in, not only does these, these little pin connectors have pressure pointing upwards towards this, this bracket, but this is also the connection that's going to connect the card to the circuit. Now, that's an SD card adapter. Now, PlayStation memory card, I mean, a lot of people got PlayStation. You know, I've noticed that the pin spacing inside of this connector here is the same pin spacing inside of here. So what you can do is pull out, you cut off the bottom row, literally you cut all of that off. Using a hacksaw, there's a spacer here and a spacer here. What you can do is you pull out the pins and you use a flat bladed hacksaw to make those little slices. And you can actually make the mating connector for this card. Now you might not think that's all too useful, but if you Google... Uh, if you Google search uh, PlayStation 1 card memory reader, you can actually create a very simple interface to interface your card straight into your printer port. 
I don't know if it works on XP, but we'll leave that for another project. Now, everything else I plan on doing is for the Xbox, because a lot of people have Xbox, and Xbox is natively USB, okay? Now, of course, we've got the breakaway cable. Now, when you're going to make a connector, you have to go and take, take a look at your connector. You know, pull it away from you, look at it a bit close, look at it at different angles, understand the dimensions of the cable. You have to understand that there is a board, I mean, the, the mating connector needs to be inserted into the throat of this thing, okay? It's, sometimes it's a deep throat, sometimes it's a, it's a shallow sow. So it's all up to whatever kind of connector you've got. Now, this connector has two rows. It's got a top row and a bottom row. Three on the top or two on the bottom, depending on how you look at it. So these copper boards are two-sided. Lucky us. So this is going to be the adapter. Notice that I've got three on the top, two on the bottom. Now, taking a handy-dandy tape measure, I've measured that the top, the pins themselves have to be roughly one millimeter and the space between them, one millimeter. Hey, it just so happens that Mr. Sharpie Marker over here has roughly a one millimeter tip. So just, just drawing straight lines as straight as possible. When you're drawing lines on your board, um, you gotta remember that this is exactly how it's gonna look. So if you like scribble on it and there's like, you know, ink blobs and, you know, breaks in the track, like breaks in the ink and you see copper through it, it's gonna show. I mean, it's gonna look ugly. Um, and you want reliability, so, you know, using a bright light, always make sure that your tracks are nice and solid, like, you know, I got some breaks over here and feathering, but I really don't care, okay? And once we etch that, what we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bisect a PS2 to USB adapter. I mean, we've pro you probably got a ton of these laying around the house. They come with every new mouse and new keyboard. Using a very sharp utility knife, I'm going to bisect it around the side, remove this piece, and then solder the USB connection onto this, sandwich it back together, and then epoxy it. I mean, it doesn't look the greatest, but, I mean, it looks much better than, uh, than, well, pretty much anything else I've seen people make, and it just fits in. There you go. Um, a, a side note is that if you notice, this connector actually has, um, kind of like a, sh like the, the, the pin with two, the side with two pins is actually shorter on, the board is actually shorter than the top, this top side, so if you got a lady in the house, you know, Hope you all have a mother, because if you have two daddies, that's just weird. Then again, if you did have two daddies, you'd still have a nail file. Either way, you're safe. Okay, as long as you're, st you're living with either one of your two gay daddies or your mom or sister, go get an emery board. And what you do is, at an angle, you sand it. And what that's going to allow is the taper that they have for this connector. So, just, there you are. That's that. Enough about that. Okay, another thing I want to do is um, the memory card slot for the for the for the controller. This is going to uh, fit inside the memory card slot and I'm going to go and get a female USB connector from wherever the hell you decide to get a female USB connector from. You can go and get you can get them from computer mod shops that sell like the back panel uh, USB, you know, you can go and scrap them again from, you know, your victimized raped PS2 adapter. There's plenty of places you can get them. Don't ask. And Again, I looked inside the controller and I measured that inside that there's a one pin, a one millimeter pin width with a one millimeter gap. Again, okay, blah. Now, this pin right here isn't supposed to be there. That's actually a gap, but I put it in because of reference. I wanted to make sure that, you know, all the pins lined up. So instead of having to take a ruler, just one millimeter, I think that's a millimeter, I think that's a millimeter, and I just drew straight lines. And I actually brought this up to my memory card and I made sure that they all lined up to the pins. Now, you're still going to have to go in and you're going to have to sand the sides down. You're going to have to make it a little flatter on the top. But we'll leave that for the, uh, the post etching. Okay. These little buggers. I'm, I've actually been you know, quite proud of this one. I can't believe I far as gumped myself into this position. Um, I have a wireless controller for my PS2. And of course, you know, you can, you can tell that there's not too much room inside to crack it open and add USB ports. They do have USB ports, but that's only to add the memory cards on. Uh, trust me, I've tried plugging this into the computer using these. It doesn't detect. So I really didn't feel like ripping out the, uh, the Xbox connectors and putting in USB because I still wanted to use them on my Xbox. Now, granted, I can go and make a USB to Xbox connector, blah, blah. I just didn't want to deal with it. I don't want to mess this thing up. I really like this. So what I did is I opted to create the mating connector, which is around here somewhere. Somewhere. Oh, I'm sitting on it. I was wondering why my asshole was tingling. Okay. I made a printed circuit board, 
Okay, and here's the little fins that I've sacrificed out of uh, that printer uh, floppy drive connector. Okay. Created a PCB, printed circuit board, which just basically just brought the tracks down. And as I was rummaging through my lab, I noticed that I had a couple of pieces of half-inch copper pipe. And I was thinking to myself, you know, these almost look like it'll fit. So what I did was, this one's actually polished, by the way. This one's just stock, just laying around in the lab, just to show you it actually could look good. And I squished one. And after I got done squishing it, I said to myself, holy shit, that looks like it'll fit. And it did. Now, unfortunately, like an ass, in my excitement, I actually smoothed down this side, and I polished it, and, you know, I took my files to it, and I smoothed it and made it nice and pretty, and I drilled the wrong end. So... What happens now is I built this, and it fits in like so. It matches up, but, you know, it'll fall right out. You know, bleh. So, knowing that this fit around it, what I did was I drilled straight through this, through the back end of the PCB. Like, well, I drilled through this end first, and then drilled through the PCB inside it using the pipe as a guide. So now this fits, fits in. Now, I'm not going to you know, feed the bolting because I'm not going to bore you, but there you go. I'll actually put some, some pictures of the, of the post process of this on the, uh, on the forums. And then there you go. It fits right in and it just leads right into a USB connector. So now you don't have to go to your, to your Xbox controller, cut it in half, which completely destroys all resale value of it. And then crappily wire in a, uh, a USB connector and you don't have to go out and buy some kind of overpriced, you know, piece of crap. Now, you can do this with PVC pipe, but PVC pipe is uh, way bigger than this, like the outer and inner diameter, so it doesn't fit as snug. I mean, it's pretty simple. Once you have your pipe, you just put it in, your, in a vise or in a wrench and just start squishing it. You know, just slowly squish it. You know, every once in a while... Double checking for fit. All right, still. All right, you know, it's a little snug, so we'll give it a little bit more. There you go. Now it fits. Yeah, still a little snug. I'd go and refine it and try to make it absolutely oval. If you don't have a vise, you can also use just a regular pair of pliers. You can use vise grips. Um, if you don't want mars and chew marks on the side, I'd highly recommend you go and put some kind of cloth around your vise. Um, otherwise, it's going to get chewed up, okay? So this is pretty much just the understanding of when you're making a connector, you have to go and look at, like, whatever you've got in your surrounding environment and see if you can make a connector out of what, what you've got laying around. Let's go, to the, um, let's go to the etch lab, and I'll show you the do's and don'ts of how to etch printed circuit boards. Okay, welcome to the etch lab, also known as my bathroom. Now, some quick safety tips, all right? If you've got long hair like me, tie it up. Put a hat on, because if you have your hair in your eyes, you can't see what you're doing. And right now we're about to work with uh, acid. It's not a very strong acid, depending on where you get it. Um, depending on how strong your, your acid is, will determine how long your etch time is. Okay? Got our hair out of nowhere. This is called ferric chloride acid. Now, I got this from Radio Shack. You, can, you probably have some kind of electronic supply shop. Now, let's see. Warning. Keep out of reach of children. Causes severe burns. Use only as directed. Internal, uh, intentional misuse by uh, ingesting or eating the contents can be harmful, even fatal. Avoid contact with skin, eyes, and mucous membranes. Okay. Don't get it in your eyes. Don't swallow it. Uh, no spitball fights with it. It's, it's an acid. It's a chemical. Don't be a dick with it, alright? You, you can cause damage with this. Um... It also stains pretty bad, so you might want to wear gloves. I could care less. Um, make sure you're wearing clothes that you don't care about because shit splashes. I like to have little wooden pokers so you can manipulate your board inside of whatever said container you're putting this acid in. Um, these are just meat skewers, and these are really crappy tweezers. I could care less about these tweezers. Now, you might be asking yourself, where do you get a container from? Save those little boxes that all your batteries come in, because this is a perfect disposable, I don't give a crap about it, it's cheap as all hell, and if anything goes wrong, big shit box. You put your circuit boards in, in, inside, and 
If you've got a porcelain sink, that's a good place to put it. Do not use, don't, don't do etching inside of a metal sink whatsoever because this, this is designed to etch away metal. Okay? When you're disposing of the acid, okay, we're only going to fill up up to, up to the board level on this, okay? A little bit past. And we're going to let it sit and it's going to etch away. When we're done, I'm going to fill the rest of this up and I'm going to spill it in my toilet bowl. Because usually the, uh, the plumbing to, to a home is plastic. If it's not plastic, it's probably lead. Either way, neither of those are affected by this ferric chloride. Ferric chloride will actually eat away some forms of steel and all forms of copper. So if you dump this down your drain, and uh, your sink drain, and you have copper fittings, which a lot of people do, or a copper trap, which a lot of people do, it will sit inside that trap and slowly eat away. I've warned you, don't pour this down your sink. Pour it down the toilet. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set this up and maybe, uh, you know, etch some boards. You know, that's the pretty much how to. A couple of the boards are done etching, and uh, now it's just a matter of piecing them together. Now, before you etch your boards, before you even draw, some, some of the things I'd like to mention is when you have your copper board, um, use some steel wool and lukewarm water to scour the board and clean it off. Try not to get the oils of your hands on the board, like fingerprints and whatnot, because it will cause problems when etching. When you're etching, um, try not to do it in like really cold environment. Um, when I was off camera doing some etching, I left my bathroom window open, and it's winter here, so it got really cold in there, and the etch the etching didn't turn turn out right on the first batch. These are actually the second batch of boards. Now, um, I'm actually I'm not actually going to go and put everything together on screen. I'm going to do it off camera because it's going to take a little while. But this is going to be the memory card adapter. Now, if you noticed in this memory card adapter, I've left um, a couple of extra solder points laying around. This is so. Um, I can actually attach like a pull handle, maybe a paper clip of some sort, because um, it's just a real pain in the ass to go and pull my first revision adapter out of the um, out of the controller. This is going to be the um, the uh, the card connector. That's actually going to be the female USB, the female uh, Xbox connector. And of course, you know, I had some unused space on the back, so I didn't decide to be a little creative because you know. Anyone that knows me knows that I like pie. This is going to be the SD card adapter. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You know, got the BSOD URL on there. Huzzah. Really not going to get too much into detail on actually piecing things together because it's just soldering and getting things in the appropriate locations. Something I'd like to do is mention with the breakaway. I'm not going to show you how to build a breakaway because it's really simple. Once you etch the board properly, just a matter of soldering the appropriate connections. Bisecting the adapter can actually be quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Um, these these PS2 to USB adapters are sometimes made out of a hard plastic that's hard to cut through and if you're kind of clumsy with uh, utility knives and razors, um, some quick tips. Use a hair dryer to heat up the plastic, make it nice and soft. Easy makes it really, really easy to cut through. Try to use a utility knife that has a thumb, uh, a thumb stop, and um, a palm stop. Using a standard box cutter, like one of these, is actually a real pain in the ass. It, it, it'll actually, you got more room for mistake and more room for injury. When you're cutting into this, never cut uh, into yourself. Always cut away. For something like this, I would highly recommend putting it in a, in a desk vise of some sort and not holding it by hand. If you are gonna hold it by hand, put your fingers behind the blade. Never put them in front, because if you slip off, you are clear, clearly going to take off the tip of your finger. And um, if you are cutting away from yourself, make sure that there is no cables, parts, components, people, or furniture that you don't want to damage that are, that are in front of you. Because if you slip off of that, you're going to cause serious amounts of damage to whatever's in front of you. So, you know, go get your gay dad or your annoying little sibling. Now, as for squashing the pipe these pieces for the Xbox to USB thingy uh, just, just squashed it in the vise what I'm gonna do is uh, actually for this one uh, I've actually taken a file a couple of uh, metal files like so I mean you don't have to but if you want it to look good and I just you know just evened it out you know I took all the burrs off you know I went inside rounded it off a little bit you know you really don't need high-speed Dremels or anything like that Okay, I'm going to go off camera, I'm going to assemble some of this stuff, and then get back to you and pretty much just recap.
Here's the SD card adapter. Unfortunately, I was a careless ass and I burnt away the tracks on each side because I was impatient and decided to use my soldering gun. So learn from my mistakes. Don't use a soldering gun. What I did was I heated up the uh, the bracket, put some solder on it, and then, well, I pre-tinned these using my soldering gun, of course. And I tried to put this on, uh, put this on, but, you know, the, uh, the, the super amount of heat that came off the soldering gun pretty much just burnt the track straight off. So, yeah, shit happens, even to the best of us. That shows you what happens when you're patient. This thing looks like crap because I'm really trying to rush this because I'm getting really bored. Here's the SD card. It just slides in. You know, it matches up to uh, all of the pin tracks. Um, when you're designing your PCB, what you could do is you can actually leave spots on here where you can solder on pieces of copper. Um, like they have the copper standoffs to um, your motherboard. You can actually solder these on so you have mounting hardware to go and attach this to whatever. Or you can just make it slightly wider and put like little little loops and whatnot that you can drill through and use it as screw mounts. So there's the SD card adapter. Broken as it may be, um, you know, with a little tender love and care and maybe some glue, it'll, it'll work. Who gives a crap? Using the advice about heating up um, your connector and cutting it, you know, along the sides, I was able to open up this connector no problem. But if you notice, there's like this waxy build-up stuff. If you just take this and snap it, you're going to pull all the pins out of your USB port. What you really would like to do is try to get this plastic wax stuff as hot as possible. Maybe even putting it um, fairly close to your stove or a lighter. Um, and then at one point, hope to God, you can actually break it away from the solder points that are on here without actually pulling them out. This is actually um, a hot glue. And of course, hot heat makes hot glue heat up. So I'm actually going to go over to my stove right now or I try to find one of my butane lighters and I'm going to try to melt this off. Don't use your soldering iron or your soldering gun because if you put this, like if this stuff gets on your soldering iron or soldering gun, it can do damage. If you really don't care, you could try the chances of just stripping all this cable away. But you know what? To tell you the truth, I think I'm going to do that first because there is a high likelihood of actually damaging this connector than uh, separating it from the wires. Plus, I could use the wire either way. Before we get to uh, all of the business end, I'd like to um, show you something. For the Xbox controller uh, memory card port, I sanded this, this part down a little bit so it's tapered. Now, I took my Xbox controller and I lined the inside with aluminum foil. Okay. Now, I'm going to solder my connector and my, uh, my pull pin onto onto the board and then I'm going to seat this inside and line up all the pins and I'm, I'm going to fill this entire thing up with hot glue and then I'm going to let it set and then when it dries I'm going to pull the whole thing out strip the aluminum foil away and then there you go you pretty much have a molded uh, molded uh, memory card adapter do not use epoxy do not use a putty epoxy do not use play-doh they will not work um, Try to use something very soft and flexible, like a pencil with an eraser end, to go and uh, mush the, uh, the foil around the inside of this as much as possible. The tighter the fit you have and the smoother your foil, the better your project is going to look. Try not to break the foil too much. You do not want the, um, the hot glue gripping the sides of the controller, because then you're going to be taking your controller apart and with a fine pick, pulling out little chunks of hot glue for a very long time. So I'm going to get to uh, sod, uh, shaving this, this board down, soldering the connector in, and uh, soldering on the, um, the um, eject thingy. I don't know what the hell it's called. I'm going to just call it the, the pull pin for now because I don't know what else the hell to call it. All right, so let me get to work on that. Here's the adapter that I just made. Now I'm going to plug this end into the memory card, making sure that they all line up properly. Then I'm going to uh, place this in this end inside the controller, and then I'm going to fill the entire thing up with hot glue. And like I said, you know, put aluminum foil around the side so it doesn't all stick. And then I'm going to set this aside. Uh, and as this cools and dries and all solidifies, I'll get to another project or another PCB. All right, slap this piece of crap together, same as the last one. What I've done was squished a piece of half inch diameter copper pipe, soldered on the fins from the uh, 
floppy drive connector onto a PCB that was designed to match up with this so I can just plug this in as is and it'll work but with it being kind of flimsy and craptastic um, this is going to slide over I'm going to take a bolt slide it through now I, I, tr I drilled the, co the copper pipe and then using the, uh, the copper pipe as a pilot hole I, uh, I drilled the, um, the PCB inside of it okay and we're going to put a nut on now what I like to do is actually put a second nut inside under here so it'll uh, kind of clamp onto the PCB and to the wire and it keeps this from flopping around a little bit and um, from this point on you can just plug it in there we go um, that's pretty much it I don't have anything else to say about this except uh, experience does count in, the, in this kind of project I'll put um, whatever I can in the show notes if you need any help with any of this I mean, I will definitely have a fully illustrated um, tutorial on how to do this Xbox connector adapter. Everything else is just, you know, I kind of threw it together. So, meh. I almost forgot to show you guys. This is the um, the memory card piece that I made for the um, for the Xbox. It's not the prettiest looking, but it works. It works well. Unfortunately, the um, the pull bar broke off. I don't really no way of fixing it, so pff, screw it. It's a little, you know, craptastic to pull out of the controller. You got to get your nails underneath and, and pull it out. Or if you got a um, a USB keyboard or mouse or something that plugs in here that's kind of tight, it'll actually pull out with it. But for the most part, I can go to any Xbox controller and at least have one USB port at this point. So there it is. You know, any questions or comments, hit the forums, hit IRC, hit the show notes. Have fun and good luck.